Hi, my name is Joelle Nagel, and I am a teacher educator at the University of Windsor in Ontario. And I'm Michael Barber, an Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Toro University, California in beautiful Vallejo. My name is Randy Labonte, CEO of the Canadian eLearning Network, or CaniLearn, and I'm situated in the wonderful waters of Half Moon Bay in the land of the Seychelles. And I'm also an adjunct professor at Vancouver Island University. Welcome to our poster presentation entitled Documenting Triage, detailing the response of Canadian provinces and territories to emergency remote teaching. This poster will describe the research that we've published over three reports during the past year that looks at the response that each Canadian jurisdiction took to the pandemic and the emergency remote teaching that they had to engage in. The first report looked specifically at what jurisdictions did during the spring when we were scrambling to address an unknown issue. The second report focused mostly upon the fall and the planning that was done over the summer to restart the next school year. Finally, the third report takes a look at various stories or vignettes from different people from different perspectives of the pandemic and the responses that each jurisdiction took. After the March 11th announcement that we were entering into a global pandemic, various jurisdictions closed their schools and then began the remote learning. As the jurisdictions ended, entered into various states of emergency remote learning, devices were delivered so that students who did not have access to devices or had limited access to the internet could still learn from home. Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland and Labrador, including some districts in British Columbia, offered these devices on loan to their students. These devices ranged from iPads and tablets to laptops and Chromebooks. Only Ontario and New Brunswick also offered access to internet connectivity which lasted until the end of the school year in 2020. In order to provide equity issues for most students in the jurisdictions, most of the jurisdictions offered offline resources. These resources included educational packages or packets, books, and various supplies such as journals, writing, and art supplies. Nova Scotia and the Northwest Territories also partnered with newspaper and radio stations so that they could have access to delivery of these packages and storytelling for their students. Only New Brunswick, Alberta and Ontario did not provide provisions for students without access to the internet. In each of the, the jurisdictions, there are various digital tools that were utilized. Most, if not all of the jurisdictions offered access to ministry created websites or had these curriculum resources available on their ministry site. Various synchronous tools included anything from Zoom, Google Meet to GoToMeeting, and the organizational tools were mostly Google Classroom, MS OneNote, and FreshBake. Some of the learning management systems also include Moodle, Learn360, and Brightspace. There were also courses and education resources available through LinkedIn Learning, MS Educator, Center, Google Teacher Center, InformNet, some ProQuest, and Ontario's TVO and Quebec's TeleQuebec television network. Because it is very important to have our teachers have access to professional learning opportunities through this challenging time, Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia and the Yukon offered some resources for online professional learning for teachers. These professional learning opportunities included anything from webinars to university courses, how-to tutorials listed on their websites, professional development days that were recorded and uploaded for the teachers, toolkits, and access to a wide variety of resources for curriculum support. When thinking about restarting the school in the fall of 2020, there were mostly no delays there was only delays in Ontario, Saskatchewan, and British Columbia due to their rising cases in COVID. With the start of the fall 2020 school year, there were a variety of options for students, mostly including back to face-to-face -face within their schools, 
but some students were offered the opportunity to continue learning through remote online education. Those students that were face-to-face -face were required to wear face masks, there was social distancing, and several other health restrictions put in place. Few restrictions offered new approaches to the remote learning options. And some jurisdictions also had districts that needed to engage in hybrid learning. There were fewer numbers of courses and secondary programs to reduce the cohorts in mixing. And there were also quad masters introduced into high school. Some of the teachers were shifting completely to remote learning while other teachers began their face-to-face -face learning. On the third report, which was released in December, we focused on the words and the experiences of the individuals who were involved, from students to parents, teachers, school administration, to try to get a sense in terms of the impact of the decisions made, but also what the pandemic and COVID uh, in their communities and in their schools, uh, the impact that it was felt by them. So in terms of the student experience, there were some quite vivid stories that we did get in. Uh, around that. And uh, a lot of students talked about the procrastination. They didn't feel motivated to, to, to go up and work on a computer and look at a screen, you know, so, and they missed their friends. Uh, they were probably doing some TikToks and a few other things in the background. But when they did have to pay attention, it was sometimes just way too much for them because a lot of teachers were trying to, you know, stick to the curriculum and do everything that they were supposed to. So they kind of overwhelmed students. And that combination actually resulted in a lot of concern uh, that began to, to, uh, to become aware of about students' health and well-being in those pandemic situations, which really became a lot more of a focus for the spring. But we'll talk about that in the next report. Um, the pace was either too fast, too slow, et cetera, all over the place. And it kind of speaks to the fact that students learn at very different levels and uh, in different ways. Uh, but because they were remote, it became that much more glaring and apparent uh, for the teachers as well to the students themselves. And as far as people is concerned, one of the things that did come up obviously is each household was not equal. Sometimes there was a lot more interference uh, with you know, different uh, students in the background that they were, but they, basically what happened is they just found it was not fun. So teachers reported uh, that students were feeling trapped and that goes back to the mental health and well-being. Uh, and there were sort of different practices, which they did say that they kept in mind, which are the four key things about looking to ensure there was equity, engagement, that they did the best that they could with their students as well, and that uh, they, they had some empathy, uh, you know, within the, their approach and how they dealt with students. So they did also find that sometimes the tried and true were the best practices. So print was used where it needed to be, obviously in the graphic that you saw earlier, certainly in the more rural uh, northern remote, remote areas uh, where it was used as well. But a lot of teachers, they were looking directly towards the, the inside of the, the schools because they were back in. Uh, and they were concerned about their health and well-being, the workplace conditions that were there. So they really focused a lot on the government announcements and, uh, you know, the, the daily briefings that were occurring. So really a lot of call for smaller classes uh, to more cleanliness and better spaces uh, for and mask mandates were certainly what teachers were looking for as part of that in those stories. As far as the school leaders and administrators, uh, they were really focused on trying to be nimble and alert if you could actually be that. Uh, but really focusing on trying to make those changes. Uh, the word pivot was used certainly in the spring a lot and it came be car became part of our, our, our words. But I would argue that pivot is uh, something that you use when you're in a speedboat, but education is more like a freighter. So uh, it doesn't turn quickly, it doesn't move quickly. And a lot of school leaders uh, really invested a lot of time and energy in trying to fill in the gaps. Uh, that they might have seen in order to address the same issues that the teachers were around equity, excellence, and, you know, empathy around with those things. But the stories that we got from the leaders was really about the toll that was extracted across the system, not to just them personally and individually, but in terms of what happened in terms of being able to address all the curricular outcomes, but more importantly, to really effectively engage with the students. The bright side that did come out of this is that there was a stronger bond and relationship uh, with parents in terms of how the schools actually worked directly with the parents in that sort of covenant. And again, equity issues, 
were very apparent and obvious in that. And sometimes uh, it was easier to do with some groups of parents in some circumstances with students and others. It was uh, very difficult if it existed at all in those situations. So remember, this is against the backdrop of the COVID-19 in terms of the infection rate, which began to spike in the, towards the end of, of in December, uh, just prior to the Christmas bake. There was a lot of lockdowns uh, that, that happened as well uh, and restrictions, but people were looking forward to hopefully getting to the, the holidays uh, and then to be able to do a reset in January and begin to return to some level of normal. Uh, but we can speak more to that with our next report in terms of what happened uh, in January through to this spring at this time now. So this research was commissioned through CanyLearn and sponsored by the organization. Uh, a little bit about who CanyLearn is, is that uh, we're a bunch of Canucks that were meeting at U.S. conferences and decided instead of going south, although we still continue to do that and very much enjoy those conferences uh, when we were able to travel, uh, is we decided to actually start doing some more in Canada because we had some great ideas and then we'd come back home and they would kind of dissipate. So we put together a national nonprofit in order to hold us together as a network. Uh, and because education in Canada is very much siloed, so the provinces and territories are in control of the education that occurs in that region and jurisdiction, there is no real national oversight for public education other than for First Nations groups that the federal government actually funds, although they're turning a lot of that responsibility back to the individual bands uh, themselves as organizations. So a national nonprofit really doesn't have a mandate federally to do anything, which is why the network is the sort of the, the, the approach that we have. And we really wanted to focus on trying to bring light to blended and online learning and make sure that research-based information is shared across in all of the provinces uh, and territories, but also that we continue to expand and learn from our, uh, with each other. So as a result, we'd also have some pretty strong connections to the, the Digital Learning Collaborative in the US as well, which is also focused on blended and online learning. If you're interested in reaching out to the Canadian eLearning Network, you can see the email address on the slide here, as well our individual email addresses were on the original title slide. The more information about the Canadian eLearning Network, as well as copies of all of our reports and additional research that the network has commissioned is available on their website and you can see the links there on the page. We'd like to thank you for watching this presentation and we look forward to interacting with you at AARA this year.